uh, we, we need China to open and for uh, Chinese uh, businesses to be traveling outside. I need to get back to China, frankly. It's been three years, uh, uh, and uh, I, I need to get back well, so, so I, can, uh, I, I can see friends uh, and uh, brainstorm on these issues together. Um, we really need to reconnect the world economy. Uh, we really need to uh, stop the nonsense of decoupling, which is a, a wrong-headed idea. Our interconnections are good and important for us. We can't solve problems on our own. Uh, we need uh, actually to see a scale-up of programs like the Belt and Road Initiative, because China is out there saying we will help our neighbors uh, and even some distant uh, neighbors to invest in infrastructure, digital, energy, transport, so that we can be interconnected together. This is a fantastic thing. By the way, it creates a lot of jobs. China exports a lot of the infrastructure, the machinery, the technology, and uh, others do as well. So those kinds of investment-led programs are extremely important. And I think China has a major role to play. You know, there was a lot of attack from the outside on the Belt and Road Initiative, almost all of it wrong, most of it for geopolitical narrative reasons, uh, because it's an important and positive initiative. Uh, within China, there were doubts or loss of uh, confidence in this approach. Well, are we just pouring money into something that doesn't make sense for us. But actually, it's an important initiative, and I really hope that it goes forward strongly. It should be, of course, a, a green, sustainable Belt and Road Initiative. But China has a huge role to play in helping to build the 21st century infrastructure in ASEAN, in Africa, in Latin America, and so forth. And that will be very good for China's economy and very good for the world economy. Uh, Professor Sachs, you chair the United Nations Millennium Project to develop an action plan for meeting the Millennium Development Goals, uh, which of, um, many of, of them concern the environment. Um, you're also president of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network launched by the United Nations. What's your biggest take from your extensive experience? Um, are we doing things right and are we doing the right things? Uh, well, no, unfortunately, it's very hard to do this right because it means changing at the global level what we do. And we do what we do at the global level for reasons, for reasons of economic incentives, profit motive, geopolitics. And we know we're heading towards a cliff, a, a climate disaster, for example. We have to change direction, but changing direction globally is, is a hard job. It requires a lot of global goodwill and cooperation among the major governments. That's why every day I say stop the war, negotiate an end to this uh, craziness and, and uh, disaster and cooperate. That's why I say every day that uh, the United States uh, needs not to, uh, to view China not as uh, an adversary, but as, as uh, absolutely a cooperative partner in a great global struggle for sustainable development, like climate change or biodiversity, where there is no alternative, really. Professor Sachs, I want to ask you about China-U.S. relations. Uh, the year 2022 has seen quite a bit of ups and downs. Your prediction for China-U.S. relations going forward? There, there is a battle in the U.S. between hardliners, so-called neocons or neoconservatives, and those who want uh, cooperative relations with China, which is a lot of us and a lot of the business community as well. That battle continues. From the neocon point of view, uh, the idea for the U.S. is to contain China, stop or slow China's progress, actually, hinder China's access to technology and ensure that the United States remains number one. That's their vision. To my mind, it is mind boggling, harmful, dangerous, provocative, can really get us into conflict and unimaginable. Who wants to contain China? What a terrible idea. Uh, what we want is economic progress that goes around for the whole world, actually and everybody can get ahead in a safe and sustainable 
manner. So the idea that the world is a zero-sum struggle, which is the neoconservative idea, is absolutely wrong. The world is a place where we're all in it together. We face some very big crises and common challenges together and where economic progress can be spread. It's not one against the other. So this is the battle going on in U.S. foreign policy. I believe that the right approach absolutely is for the two sides to meet each other, to establish again a, a, a structured strategic dialogue. Because there are a lot of complicated issues. These are two giant economies uh, with a huge sway in the world. They should be talking to each other carefully, in detail, not throwing charges in the social media and, and uh, sound bites and uh, provocative trips uh, like uh, uh, Pelosi took over the strenuous objections of, uh, of China. No, this should be a relationship of mutual respect, of prudence, and of a lot of dialogue and where necessary of some hard negotiating as well. But that's what's going to get us to be able to prosper together and to solve problems together. What I'm hoping comes out of it is a structured, ongoing, intensive dialogue. And of course, I, I very much like and promote so-called track two dialogues as well for all the rest of us that we're making as much contact, discussion, and analysis together as is possible. Yeah, I mean, foreign policy starts at home at U.S. midterm elections, where the Democrats lost control of the House. Um, how much weaker does that leave President Joe Biden and his Democratic Party? And what do you think it would mean for America's foreign policy making, especially uh, its China policy? It, well, it leaves Biden weaker in that it will be very difficult, very unlikely for Biden to pass any significant legislation going forward. Uh, even legislation actually supported pretty broadly and by both parties because the Republican majority in the House of Representatives will not want to give even political victories, uh, even if they support the substance to Biden, uh, because now in the in the U.S. mindset, we're already in the presidential elections for 2024. So there's always a, a look, what does this mean for the next election? So in this sense, I think Biden is actually considerably weakened. Uh, there won't be major legislative packages, most likely. There will be investigations uh, on many issues uh, in the House of Representatives because of the Republican majority. They'll aim to tie up the administration in many ways. Uh, you know, but with respect to Chinese foreign, foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis China, I'm not sure that this has any uh, decisive play because I would say it's the dominant position of both parties right now to take a hard line towards China. Uh, it's not wise. It's not the right foreign policy. It's not uh, serious in my view, but it's what you'll just, continued uh, in 2023. It may make uh, a push at the same time, though, towards uh, uh, more negotiating, uh, more support for negotiations, I, I should say, in, in the Ukraine war context, because a lot of the Republican side is far less enthusiastic about continuing to pour tens of billions of dollars of finance and armaments into Ukraine and actually believe, as I do, that, that we need a negotiated outcome.